Okay, we got Lance Russell on the line. Lance, how you doing today? Hey, Dave, how are you doing, partner? Hey, we're doing we're doing really well. We're doing really good. I want to read you this. God, let me get this letter. I want to read you this. We're gonna start okay. out by something real nice. You're gonna really enjoy this email we got from. Um, let me get it right here. It is from Chris Mills of Jackson, Mississippi, who, like many people, grew up watching you. And he just says, Mr. Russell, I just wanted to take a few minutes to write this note and thank you for a few things. I grew up an hour south of Memphis, and for a long time, I thought that the only good wrestler in the world was Jerry Lawler, and the only good wrestling announcer was you. Well, since that time, my opinion on wrestling has changed, but not my opinion on wrestlers has changed, but not my opinion on announcers. So, from the Here We Go Davy to By Golly, I never got enough. My grandfather, my father, and me, the love of wrestling was the one big thing that brought us together, and it was you who brought it into our living room every Saturday morning. I had the pleasure of meeting you backstage at the Mid-South Coliseum during Monday Night Memories in Memphis. I remember being really nervous walking up to you, and then totally at ease when I shook your hand and you talked to me and my wife as if you've known us for years. Thank you for your kindness and for being the greatest voice in the greatest sport in the world. Chris Mills, Jackson, Mississippi. So, Man, what a good guy. With that. Yeah. That's great, Dave. I yeah. appreciate you taking time to read it. That is something. Chris Mills, how about that? Yeah. That was a so, good night, That uh, the night he was referring to, the, the memories night. We had, had a lot of fun with a lot of guys that hadn't seen each other in a long time. It was probably better that way. <laughs> we did have a lot of fun. <laughs> Looking back, I mean, I mean, we were, we were thinking about this before you came on. Fifty years in this business. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, it's like, what would you say? I mean, would be the biggest change, and and would you say? Because I would think this that like the last three years has been the biggest change period of any last three year period in in history. I think that's probably true in terms of, of pure change. Uh, it goes back, uh, as you know, better than anybody before that time when the change started, and it really. St- it, it really came, I think, when Vince made the comments to the Athletic Commission to get out from under taxes and that sort of stuff and all of the kayfabe by the board and all of that. I mean, that made it total, totally different. It made it almost necessary to come up with an entirely different product after after that uh, took over, don't you think? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe not. I think, I think it's maybe the – I don't know if it did, but the, the – the public changed, and then when when it's, they started pushing it really quick, I think I think the competition just made everybody try to come up with the next new idea so fast that the business, you know, the business just started moving really really fast. I don't know. Yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the things that that when I watch Raw, it's funny because a lot of the stuff that they do, you know, people talk about like the short matches and long interviews and things like that, like it's something new, mm-hmm. and yet. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, 1982, you know, Memphis, glory days of Memphis. I mean, you were built around some great talkers. You had your matches in the ring, but the matches weren't necessarily long, and it was the interviews that sold the tickets. That's true. And who was sitting right there, tooth and toenail, fighting it just as hard as I could, because I used to tell uh, Jerry, Jared, and and Lawler, and the guys, we're not getting enough wrestling in there, and I I just was convinced (laughs) because uh, I was a real wrestling fan. And I thought that was it. But uh, I learned as time went by that exactly what you said was true, that uh, really the people enjoyed seeing the confrontations and and the setting up of confrontations and all that as much as they did seeing uh, wrestling in the rain. So uh, there's no doubt that that we had uh, – we, we were doing just exactly the same thing that, that they are doing today with the short matches and – Long interviews, but we had some good mouths, and uh, that's what made it work. A lot going, of it. Go, going back, do you have any, like, I mean, you probably have so many, but like any memories that like stand out, whether it be a match you saw or just a night at the Coliseum or a television angle or anything that just where you just go like, you know, this was, you know, some, you know, out of all these years, these are some moments that really stand out. Well, there's a lot of them that, that stand out. I've talked, I guess, I've, I've told a story so many times that everybody should have heard it, and that is about asking what the favorite match, and that was the uh, tag team match when uh, uh, Anoki and, and um, uh, Hiro Matsuda 
went after the NWA tag titles held by Eddie Graham and uh, Sam Steamboat, and and they did it on television, and I, I couldn't really believe that it was happening before my very eyes and mouth, and uh, and they ended up in Sam. Uh, Eddie got injured in the first fall, and Sam went ahead and took over and defended it, and, and the Japanese team ended up winning winning the tag belts, and then they had, of course, a series of matches after that, and they took it down to Florida and did it. They did it in Memphis, and then uh, they took it down to Florida, too. That probably was um, one of the most exciting bouts that I've ever seen. It was just absolutely spectacular, particularly the first fall when uh, the four of them were all in there. But there have been a lot of other things. I tell you, people think this is crazy, but one of the things that used to that really knock me out, as I remember, is when Dave and I were were <laughs> faced with that Dr. Frank box that, uh, that Lawler uh, had conceived, you know, and we had the noise that sit, when the box was sitting beside us. It was It was kind of a fun thing, a totally different thing than... The tag match that I was talking about. That's totally <laughs> different. Oh my god. Huh? That's totally. Yeah, Doctor, I, I just want to kind of recreate the thing because I've, yeah. I've seen it. They, they, it was like a box, and was it like Lawler bringing out like a mystery tag team partner or something? Yeah. yeah well, they brought the box out without really any conversation about it, and uh, and Dave and I were sitting there saying, "What in the Sam Hill is in that box?" You know, it was like something that we didn't know anything about. And people don't believe that, and that's okay too. But we didn't know anything about it. We just winged it, and the way it—I mean, the way it came—that's the way it was, and uh, that primarily is the way it worked. Well, the box is sitting there, and then we start hearing these noises uh, start coming from the box, you know. And so then we kind of got into the whole act, and finally got got the door open. Here's Doctor Frank. <laughs> it comes walking out of. <laughs> You know, for, you know, for, for, for a, a product that you're tr trying to sell as legitimate, sometimes things like Dr. Frank, <laughs> I don't know. That, I mean, I can see that happen? more. I can see that more today when, you know, like on the Vince Russo show than like, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's like a, basically for, for people to know, Dr. Frank was a guy dressed like Frankenstein. That's sitting exactly in there in a right. box. Yeah. And they opened up the box and there was like. Frankenstein is some tag team partner, you know. Yeah, he, that's exactly what he did. He came on the scene as that, and and um, it, it it was amazing. But you know, Dave, there, there seemed to be because this is kind of the way that Dave Brown and I felt about the thing. There seemed to be a period of time when when they would bring out these various things, and we had all, as you know, all kind of characters. But then there was, we would say, okay, this is the fun and games time. We didn't really say that, but, I mean, by the action and the things that took place. And people kind of seemed to separate that. It was different than uh, Jerry Lawler looking down uh, his nose at Bill Dundee and saying, I'll cut your wife's hair off. And, I mean, everybody knew that they were dead serious about it, and, and it they were just two different kinds of things that happened, and people seemed to uh, to be able to separate them uh, with no problem at all. They liked it that way, and they didn't try to confuse the Doctor Frank with um, the Green Brothers against whoever, or Lawler and Dundee, or whoever it might be. You know, one of the things you just brought up when they shaved uh, Bill Dundee's wife at the time's hair. Ooh. What was that? What was that like uh, going in? Because that was. Even by Memphis standards, and I know it had happened before with Gorgeous George, but I mean by that standard, you know, shaving a woman's head in the ring was yes. pretty pretty different. Yeah, and how'd she do? And, and how'd, she, how'd they get her to agree to it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Dundee took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that was not a job that I had. That's for sure. But I tell you what was really the odd thing when Lawler ends up winning the match, and and it was time for Bev. Dundee's head to be shaved, and we had a and a barber who who was an old timer had been had a barber shop in in Memphis for years and years, and he did all of our our hair cutting, and he was always nervous when he got in the ring because he thought 
one of these big monsters who was going to sit down and crush him totally to death, you know. So he was he was really nervous about it. Well, he was particularly nervous when it came the task to shave Bev Dundee's head. And he got up there and he grabs her hair and let's say that her hair is uh, nine inches long and he pulls up and everybody, yeah, no, no, don't do that. Don't cut her hair. Don't cut her hair, you know. And he's hearing all of this conversation and so he clips off about an inch and a half. <laughs> Of that nine inches. And then he goes to another spot. No, don't cut her hair. Don't cut her hair. And he does the same thing once again. And then it went on for about three or four or five times. And all of a sudden, the music changed. Boo. (laughs) Cut her hair. (laughs) They got hot at him because he wasn't cutting the hair off, you know. (laughs) And so we're up there saying... Mr. Catlin, cut the hair away. <laughs> Take the hair off of her head. It was really funny. You, you, you hear the comedy routine about, <laughs> boy, they can turn on us tonight in a minute. You know, well, that's the way this was. <laughs> they wow. turned on everybody because uh, they resisted having her hair cut, but then when they didn't cut the hair, that's what they came to see. Uh, they wanted it the other way. So they ended up, they ended up cutting. They didn't do her ball the way they did the guys, but he, uh, he did cut off a good bit more to save our lives. Uh, this is from JP in San Francisco. He's got a lot of questions for you, Lance. Okay. It says, uh, it says, you probably have one of the best vantage points in the evolution of professional wrestling of anyone. What elements or characteristics of pro wrestling that have kind of disappeared over the years would you like to have seen, would you like to see brought back? Like things that they don't do anymore that they used to do that you kind of miss. <coughs> hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, I um, I think, you know, I might change my mind after I got my wish, but uh, I think I would rather um, have it go back to the way it was uh, in, in the 60s and in, in the 70s than it is now. Uh, and and you know I don't I, I really I don't know whether it's something that just automatically comes with getting old or what it is, but it's just you know all all the old timers that I know, and I don't know any hardly but old timers anymore. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it seems like we all feel the same way that it was a better product, and it, and we were a lot more proud to be involved with it and. And all, and um, and so that's one thing that that I would like to see. Uh, Dave, any comments? <laughs> Do you hear that? Do you hear that often or not? As far as like the in ring work or just everything in general? Um, you that? I well, I you know I don't really think you can separate the two of them to to get what I'm uh, and to to arrive at a product that I'm talking about. I mean, this is a a talking. This is a product that uh, the fans lived and breathed with, and don't be bringing up any of this stuff about uh, phony or anything like that. And they and I, uh, while there's an awful lot of high flyers, and I know that attracts the audience today, and they really go in for that. Um, although I don't know why, I get the feeling that maybe we've almost satiated the appetite for high flyers and stunt machines and, and and that kind of thing and maybe people are are interested in a little more um, basic wrestling is is I think it was referred to. I don't think you can hardly separate the in ring thing from, from the outside product because the attitude in relationship to the product I guess is what I'm talking about. And that probably would be the biggest thing that I would like to see come back. Uh, I'd have to think a long time about some other things. Um, I know that there are some things <laughs> that I would just as soon not see. Uh, I think the the product has gotten far too racy and is just uh, depending on too much sex and that sort of thing. And uh, it uh, has... Again, as all the old timers say, uh, what are they doing putting the word wrestling up on the marquee? <laughs> because they, they have so very little of it. Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't, right offhand, I can't think of anything 
else that I would uh, that I would like to see come back. And I don't know. I really don't know that um, I would like everything that took place uh, back in the era that I was talking about to come back. I went to see the last Pensacola, Florida, a WWF show, and um, I really enjoyed myself. It was the first time, Dave, that I had been to a house show in quite some time, and I, you know, probably went in there with a little resentment the way the product had changed and saying, ah, it was a lot better in our days and all that. And I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed watching all the stuff that went down. And uh, some some good athletes uh, were on the floor, too. So uh, I, I certainly am not knocking all of the product that they're putting out today, that's for sure. Yeah, the last, the last time I went to a, a WWF house show, I mean, I enjoyed... Pretty much like maybe every match, but one or two. And yeah. I mean, even the ones, even the ones that I would say weren't good, in their own way, they were entertaining. That's right. I, you know, and it escapes me uh, at this time. Gee, how can that happen? Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to think. Who is it that, uh, that Brian Christopher uh, works as a tag team partner? Scotty, Scotty Too Hotty. Yeah, yeah, Scotty Too Hotty. I the worm. love their match. I mean, it was entertaining as the devil. And uh, I, you know, I've, I've watched, I've watched Brian for so long, and I just really think that he's a lot better than um, uh, he's a lot better athlete and, and wrestler than uh, than he seems to be in terms of uh, uh, acceptance and all. But uh, that match was just a heck of an entertaining match, and and what you said is right. I mean, it's just they're they're fun stuff. They're really fun stuff. Now, I don't know how you compete when, when they uh, when they can come out there and when you can't put on that kind of entertaining stuff, it's it's hard to compete. Now, one one person asked this. this is actually, the same question. This is an interesting thing. You, know, you spent years and years and years announcing out of that TV studio. You've done some broadcasting out of the arena setting. Yes. Um, what what do you think are the pluses and the minuses? Because you know, pretty much nobody's doing TV studio wrestling. Uh, no, I mean, I haven't seen it. I, I haven't seen a small TV studio. Is there any t- Brian? Are there any small TV studio stuffs going around? I don't not, think so. Not with the big companies. I mean, I watched like, um, you know, sometimes like ECW will, will tape at a building that only holds a thousand people. Yeah. But but that's not like the Memphis TV oh, studio. No, I mean, the Memphis. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's I mean a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, but the I mean, I mean, obviously Memphis. I guess Memphis would be the last one. The Randy Hale show. Mm-hmm. So what do you now? As someone who did TV studio wrestling for decades, I mean, what are your thoughts as far as, like, there are a lot of strengths of the studio, and yet sometimes when I watch the Randy Hale stuff, the, the studio looks, it looks almost like a throwback, which I guess maybe is okay in Memphis because it's 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 so similar to what was always done. That's right. It's, it's, it's coming essentially out of the same studio that at least half of our time was spent over there at uh, the Scripps Howard station doing it, and the other station, at WHBQ, the RKO General Station, it was the same thing. It was a studio, and we just transferred the the show over to uh, another station. Um, the pluses and minuses of it: uh, there is kind of nothing like doing a show in an arena, and I think it. Uh, I think it's true of anybody who participates in it. There's nothing like uh, hearing that crowd that uh, that responds when you've got one of the big crowds, and particularly if you were doing uh, doing any of the pay-per-views or anything like that. You hear that big crowd respond, and there's just nothing exactly like that. There's no way to to get around it. But on the other side of the uh, the coin, when you're talking about working in the small you, there is an intimacy, and when the guys walk up and get into a beef with somebody in the crowd, you 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 can feel it, and the people sitting right around, and and almost everybody is sitting right around where it's happening. It it brings about uh, an atmosphere of of real conflict and uh, irritation and. And if it's intended, it brings about that humor. It just seems to be a uh, something 
which does not get over, and they don't really attempt to do, although there is some of it done back and forth between between the crowd. And even when they're down, when the guys are 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 having conflict with each other, running their mouths at each other, they're right up next to the people in in the uh, studio, and it just it too it brings on a on a different atmosphere. I like that aspect of it. I, I don't I don't know that I'm really saying that it's more real. Or not, I, that isn't really what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying it, it seems to bring out some more real emotions. Uh, I remember more real emotions because a lot of the stuff that's in, in front of the big crowds today, the people that are reacting in the crowd are reacting to get at their 15 minutes of fame in front of, you know, five, eight thousand people or how many ever people happen to be there. They're trying to get the reaction from the crowd as as much as uh, anything. And where in the little studio they they were kind of get the reaction of Jerry Lawler or or Bob Armstrong or whoever it was that was uh, wrestling in front of them. I think that looking back, I think that from an interview standpoint, it's real different. And I think that the interviews in a studio made for better interviews because when you're doing the interview in front of like ten thousand people. Yeah. You're 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 doing like an entertainment promo because you're trying not to lose the audience and you're waiting for the audience to respond to what you say and you're kind of like playing a game with the audience whereas the promos before they would look into the camera and yeah you know there'd be fifty hundred people there but you're looking into the camera and you're trying to sell a ticket to the guy on the other side of the screen whereas the other one you're trying to do this kind of more like an entertainment thing. Yeah, I think you're right, Dave, and it's a good point too because uh, I think the very fact that the name, um, and I don't know whether it came from you or who it came from, but uh, the, they call them promos now, as opposed to interviews is the way we used to refer to them. And um, really there was more, at least in our presentation, there was more interview. It wasn't just one person. It was uh, Dave Brown talking to... Uh, Frank Morrell or whoever it was, and it was Lance Russell talking to Bill Dundee and George Barnes, and uh, you know it was it was in fact an interview. Whereas I think today they um, the guys are are polished to do what you say, make a uh, a showbiz type of promotion, and to call them promos is absolutely right. Is there ever a moment, uh, or what would I? It probably was, but. Uh... Is there a moment that you can come up with where you were the most scared, whether it was from a wrestler or something went wrong in, on TV or the fans getting out of control of the show? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I guess the most scared that it ever happened to me was a uh, terrifying uh, night. Uh, now, take it back into the 60s, and if you can picture the racial climate that took place in Memphis, Tennessee, well, not only Memphis, but this is what we're talking about is Memphis. Um, most of the um, the shows that came in there, whatever they were, they had at that time relegated the balconies to uh, the black clientele. And they were not, you know, it was not a totally integrated situation. And and um, as things and the heat started to to turn up in in the racial front, we had a situation at the old auditorium, which had a big balcony that ran around like so many of the old uh, coliseums and arenas, and somebody dropped a uh, knock a, a, a glass or, or a, a Coke bottle or something like that off of the balcony down, and it hit a, a uh, white patron on the head down. And all of a sudden, um, we, we had ourselves a full-blown racial situation. I mean, it was so ugly that you asked me if I remembered one, I'm telling you one I remember. <laughs> and I'll tell you the most terrifying moment of all was 
as everybody cleared out, all the wrestling personnel cleared out and went backstage, and and the police were around trying to settle things down and do this, and it just got in. All of a sudden, zing, here comes a knife with a four-inch blade sailing through the air and hits in the aisle and goes ripping down uh, the aisle along the floor. It didn't hit anybody. Uh, and it was just really a terrifying situation. Well, I um, about the time that knife came by, I say, it's time that I get out of here and stop pretending like I've got control. So I ran backstage and back there. But when looking back, I'm saying, man, we are never going to get this thing out of a real war if we don't put something in there that's going to entertain them. Entertain them. And so... Being young and stupid, I went back out to the ring and jumped up in the ring and grabbed the microphone and started doing it. And it started introducing a couple of guys that uh, agreed to go out there and get get going in a match. And I'll be a son of a gun. It, it couldn't have been three minutes of time from the time that these guys got in the ring and we rang the bell and the match started till the whole thing settled down. And what was just an absolutely terrifying, ugly situation uh, turned back into what they came there for was to see a, a wrestling match where somebody was going to bust somebody else. And uh, so that's one thing that I remember, Dave. Is that kind of what you had in mind? Yeah, very much so. And I also want to remind everyone that tomorrow on the show we are going to have Missy Hyatt for the first time, which should be... A very interesting show. Lance Russell's very familiar with Missy Hyatt. Yeah, you tell Missy hi for me. I have not seen her in a long, 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 long time. I remember when I think of Missy Hyatt on Memphis Wrestling. I don't know if you remember this spot, but you were doing you were doing some sort of a trivia thing, and you know, of course, Eddie Gilbert, who was Missy Hyatt's um, husband at the time, um, knew he knew all the wrestling trivia from Memphis. I don't remember what the question was. But, you know, it was like one of these things. I, I don't even remember the whole thing, but I just remember, like, it was wrestling trivia. And, like, Eddie would just come out there, and, like, the fans were supposed to, like, write in or, or call in or something. And Eddie would just give all the answers. Yeah. Well, Missy gave some of the answers, too. I think mean, yeah, Eddie well, brought could, up and gave well, Eddie them told, Missy. Eddie, Eddie huh? told her. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do remember that, as a matter of fact. And I think <laughs> that Missy, every, every time we used to see each other, bump into each other, but... <laughs> We bring up that very situation because it it, it was one of those uh, one of those conflict things. We had, we had an interesting contrast. Thing. Listen, let me ask you a question, Dave, just real quick. What uh, what about Brad Armstrong? Is he uh, is he back where he can work again, or what? I heard about his his knee and all. Um, he's not working yet, Brian. Right, he hasn't been working. He hasn't worked in months, has he? No. No, he got run over in, in the parking lot. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I read that supposes? in the Observer, and uh, uh, I, the, a lot of the uh, the Armstrongs live in the area where where I'm living now, and and so I was particularly interested. Brad was uh, a friend going back a long ways. Yeah, well, you would have known his father way, way back. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Way back from Jerry Jerry Lawler, Bob Armstrong feud in Memphis. Yes, sir. Yeah. Bob, fresh out of the firehouse in Marietta. <laughs> That's right. Firefighter from, and brought it, yeah. We got, we got a full bank of calls. I want to start with JD in Pittsburgh. JD, what's going on? Hi, Dave. Hi, Lance. Hi, Brian. How are you guys doing tonight? Hi, JD. All right, I want to talk to you guys about a few things about last night's Thunder Show, if I could. Um, briefly, I want to talk about a couple, one person in particular, Scott Steiner, as far as his actions go. I mean, I understand he's the heel character on all in WCW right now, but I have to ask you, David, maybe you guys could comment on this real quick. Do you think the way his actions have been lately, especially provoking the referee and pushing him, he hasn't been suspended or worse to find by the WCW? I mean, you know the uh, world cannot touch an official. No, I think, I'm sure it's encouraged. I'm sure that they're encouraging him to do that first character, so I wouldn't really worry about that. It's the stuff he does that you don't see that I would worry about, and he does do that. Right. He, he, goes off, he goes off the edge a lot. We know that. Well, maybe, maybe that's why it's so believable when he does it on camera, because deep down we know that he possibly really could be doing this. Scott Steiner's like. should be banned from the crowd. We understand he's a great heel and everything, but they should take some action with the actions he's been portraying in the ring. I mean, you, the rules are simple. You do not touch an official when you're in the ring. You do not. You, uh, if you, you do, if you, on it. They you do if you're told to. Shady, we got to get running, okay? See you guys. Okay, let's go to... Let's get a friggin' flare. 
I'll tell you what, the, the one thing about Steiner, though, is, as far as um, he is probably the, would you say the only guy, Brian, in today's wrestling that when you watch him on TV and you're watching on a screen and he's thousands of miles away, he's still scary? Oh, yeah. That guy is so scary. Boy, he's you know. scary, that's for a fact. I mean, and you could just tell everyone who works with him, and I mean, yeah. everyone around, the announcers are scared to death when he's out there wrestling, because they're afraid of, like, what if he hears us say something? I mean, you ever hear, like, like nobody ever criticizes Scott Steiner as an announcer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think oh they should let him go in the crowd, because one of these days, someone's going to spill a pop on him on accident, and he's really going to just destroy him. Or someone's going to shoot him. I'm just waiting. Just yeah, out of, that could happen. Just, just out of be, being scared to death. I mean, if that guy came near me and he had like, like, like that, that eye, you know, that eyes look and the way he looks, well, actually, I would run. But <laughs> if you're stuck in a corner, what do you? Oh my God, I don't want to think about that one. Uh, let's, let's go to uh, Don in uh, Long Beach. Hey, how you doing today? We're doing really good. All right. Uh, for some reason, they call me Don, but my name is Ben, but that's minor. <laughs> uh, but that's 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 my problem. Okay, Dan. Okay. Sorry, Dan. Um, I got a question for you guys. I'm not sure you guys covered this yet, but uh, Rob Van Dam. What did he yes. you? Uh, what about there's, you? There's a rumor that he was backstage at the Long Beach Thunder show. He absolutely was. That's he not was a rumor. Backstage. He absolutely was, and he was. Even though everyone denies it, he was in fact talking to some people and talking about uh, perhaps getting in. Not not like, not like uh, you know. I mean, he was more doing it the sly way, where it's like, hey, can I get a job here? It's just sort of like, well, what if, what if. Um, you know, I mean, he was he was he was certainly. I mean, it came up to certain people that he that he knew, but it, he didn't. He didn't try to broadcast it or anything like that. Okay. But he, he was at the, uh, was at the Thunder show. show. and I didn't see him there. I was backstage uh, hanging out, and he was, I didn't see him at all. Yeah, he was definitely there. Wow. I talked to many, many people who were to talk to him. Okay. I'd kind of like to see him go to WCW. That way he wouldn't get, like, lost in the shuffle or anything. He'd be a major wouldn't? star there. It uh, depends on who's booking. That's true. Uh that's I mean, true. if they had a booker who wanted to go with him. You know, I mean, he's a talented guy. If they had someone who wants to go with him. They could, and if they have someone who wants to bury him, you know, they could do that too. Yeah. Uh, I would think that for him, it'd be better in WCW because they need to create a star. Mm -hmm. Whereas WWF, it's going to be tough. Look at look at look at like Raven, and you know, like they just don't. It's it's getting over in WWF is really tough, and and Van Dam's style and what he does, a lot of that stuff, he's not going to be able to do in WWF. He's not going to have the leeway to do those moves because they they don't want guys getting hurt. You know, and he Plus, some of those. Right now, those Focusing on the on WWF for any type of character violations, and Rob Van Dam, he's been all over the cover of High Times and things like that. I mean, the the PCC would have a field day with him. Man, I, th I think that if, if they advertised it on television like they do on ECW, yes, for sure. But if they just told him to shut up and don't talk about it, I I don't know that I don't know that we broke because you know you you had. Not all that long ago, you had the Godfather doing the, you know, and and Road Dog and some of these guys with the the T-shirts and with the mannerisms, X Pac, and you know they that that was on, only recently. So and now you know they're still around. They just, yeah, I think they would just tell them to like kind of totally shut up, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I kind of would like to see him go to WCW. That way they could try and build around him. Uh, him and Lance Storm have some great matches. They could, but but uh, you know, again, like it depends on who the Booker is because I could see. You know, he'd, he'd walk into a situation where you still got that enough of that old click there that doesn't let new guys, get, you know, the Luger, Scott Steiner, Nash click. They don't really let new guys break through to the top very easily. And uh -huh. he's going to be real frustrated because Rob Van Dam, you know, thinks he's a top guy. And, and you know, and, and to his credit, based on his ECW, he's not wrong. But they'll have people whispering, you know, hey, you know, he doesn't know psychology, and he doesn't, you know what I mean? You'll, you'll hear it, and they'll, it depends on if the booker's going to listen. And I, and I don't know, you know, again, you know, Rob Van Dam is much better in, in 15 matches, minute matches where he can do a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, the three minute match, you know, he's not, he's not good at a short match, because right. he's never been asked to do them. That's very true. Okay. Well, that's all I had. Okay. You're very welcome. Let's go to Tony in New York. Tony, what's going on? Guys, how you doing? Very good. Hi, Lance. Hey, hey Tony. A pleasure, a pleasure to talk to you. Bless your heart. Thank you. I got to tell you, I have never, ever seen you uh, do a show live, a current show, but I've seen hundreds of hours of shows that you've broadcast, you know, via uh, collecting and trading videos. And it's just, uh, so I feel like, uh, even though I've never seen you live, 
I, I feel like I know you just, and I've just really enjoyed the work you've done over the years. Well, bless your heart. Thank you very much. Tony. I got to tell you, there's uh, there's many many different memories, but there's one particular one that I just enjoyed, and I wanted to see if you had remembered it. Uh, it's a classic, uh, at least we think so, amongst the friends that have watched uh, this. It was back in 1985, and uh, you had two kids, like from Miami, I guess, two high school guys who were there to present the tag team of the. Pete Lederberg and Howard and uh, Howard Baum. That's I know those exactly guys. It. Yeah, yeah I, 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 go through the story. I remember this thing to distinctly, what you're going to say. So uh, uh, it was for the award for 1984, and then um, Eddie Gilbert comes out and, uh, uh, you know, thanks the guys for the award, but starts kind of ripping on Tommy Rich because he's a big star and he doesn't come around anymore. And he's really ripping on him, and then Tommy Rich comes out with his blue suit on and, just, you know, beats the heck out of Eddie Gilbert, and you guys go to commercial, Lance, and then you come back from commercial, and there you are interviewing a bloody, bloody Eddie Gilbert, blood everywhere, and he just gives you this sob story about how he feels bad for what he did, and basically you give him the old, it takes a better man, Eddie, to admit your mistakes, and, and then finally uh, Tommy comes out and they uh, make up and everything's fine, and then as soon as Tommy turns around, Eddie gives it to him, and just it, the thing that yeah. I just enjoyed <laughs> and, and so and much Tommy, about Tommy it. Tommy Rich is bleeding all over the place. The thing I enjoyed so much about it was how mad you portrayed to be in that, more so than I think anybody else was. How Tommy had gotten over, on, or Eddie had gotten over on you. I just thought it was just a tremendous scene. Do you remember that one? Well, yeah, I remember part of it. I don't remember as much detail as you said, and I really <laughs> appreciate you bringing that up, Tony, because I hadn't thought about it in quite some time. And and um, we had several instances with Eddie that were memorable, and uh, that was that was one of them, and with Tommy too, needless to say. And and uh, so I thank you very much for bringing that. Back to my uh, all of the detail back to my mind. Oh, it's, it's a, I'm sure there's you know in the grand scheme of things it's probably just a small thing, but I don't know. I just thought it was just a classic studio uh, episode of, of wrestling from down there. You know uh, everything I've ever seen. You, you know, pardon me. I'm glad you said studio episode because it's just what we were talking about, Dave, a little bit ago. I think that kind of thing is what comes over so well in a small setting as opposed to working in front of 10,000 people. Pardon me, Tony, go ahead. No, you know, I wanted to ask you, like, uh, from watching wrestling from the late, late, late 70s to now, um, I enjoy, I enjoyed it then, I enjoyed it now, but I think the one thing that's missing now when I watch wrestling from back then is, is I think back, back then there was more real, real hatred between the fans and certain wrestlers, the bad guys, the heels. And I don't think that you really have that today. Do you well, think that's you, true? Or? You oh, I, I think there's no, qu go ahead, I think there's no question. Yeah, I think there's no question it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, Tony would be in a better position to know than I uh, would because I, I, in one, because of the area that I live in, and we don't have that many uh, matches, and, and two, I just haven't been to that many matches recently. But it certainly is my impression that is exactly right on. You hit it on a button, and it absolutely is true. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't go to matches, and the hatred thing isn't there. You know, like if you look at, you know, with, with the top heels, like it was, and it's, I mean, it, you know, in a sense, maybe it's better because those guys aren't, you know, getting their tires slashed when they leave the building, <laughs> like a lot of the, like a lot of the, which was not unusual in the in the old days, so to That's speak. Right. But, uh, but um, yeah, it's a different. The the audience is is there. It's kind of, the audience is there to be entertained, whereas the older audience, it was so much more emotional. I mean, it was, you know, I mean. The, the, every little move and nuance would get a reaction because they were watching this thing seriously. I mean, now it's like, you know, again, it's like the big stuff and the pantomime and all that is what they're into because they're looking to, for the guys to do something to entertain them as opposed to win the match or, you know, vanquish the heel or whatever it would be. You know, Dave, uh, we started going to EC, the arena, ECW arena, back in like 94, 95, and a big group of people here from New York 
we wouldn't even, weren't even going to the shows here for a while, you know, WWF, WC, whatever. And it was, and that was one of the things that we liked so much about going to that arena. It was like old time, real, real emotion in that building that you just don't get in the, you know, there's different types of emotion, but you felt like at any moment a riot almost could break out when you used to go there. And I think that's the way it was back in, you know, the very late 70s, early 80s when I used to go to the garden, you know, at Madison Square Garden. There used to just be some real emotion in the building, a different type. It's now it's more of like a, a rock concert type of uh, a show type as opposed yeah, to yeah, see, yeah, see, see the stars come to your town. The yeah. yeah. I ever got to that was that one AAA show down before Bash of the Beach. Oh, the, in L.A.? Yeah. They had the, the, the earlier triple... Insane. The earlier, before that one, because I was at that one, Brian, the, the original triple A show at the L.A. Sports Arena, the one that sold out and turned all those people away, that may have been the most heated show that I ever was at in my life and, and, and scariest audience. In, in, it, I mean, like, no one got hurt, but you were you were at this thing when, like, especially when Art Barr was out there or Jake Roberts, that... There was like at any moment there could be a riot. Thankfully, there never was. And and um, I mean, in fact, and I remember Jake Roberts and uh, Page. I mean, they were they. I don't know. In fact, we should, we should talk to Page about this one. I remember Page and Jake Roberts back to back, and this was no act. You know, just waiting and waiting because they they didn't know what was going to happen next. And the next night, they were in San Diego. This was after the show that I'm talking about. It was Jake Roberts. It was Page, and they had this big fat bodyguard with them that they didn't have before and I just think that you know it was like uh, when they came to the ring I mean San Diego wasn't nearly as bad as LA but I think that they were from LA I think they were scared out of their mind and needed enough, <laughs> knew that they may need, need help the next night last comp uh, comment on Memphis Lance yep. uh, another one uh, was a tag team match between the uh, Rock and Roll Express and the Papos mm -hmm. and uh, just it, it seemed unusual to me because uh, during at, at the end of that, uh, the Macho Man pile drove Ricky uh, Morton. Ricky Morton through the table, which you didn't. I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, you did, it didn't seem like there was a lot of that going back, going there on wasn't. in the early '80s, and that was the <laughs> situation there. Like it seemed like if if the fans could have climbed over that guardrail to get the Poffos as they tried to get them out of that building, they would have definitely have done something to them. Yeah. Well, you're right about that. During that whole period of time. Um, and it started because it came out of a real event, and that was with with Angelo and and uh, Randy and uh, the guys um, coming in trying to take over the territory in Memphis. And so what I'm saying that all came out of a real event, and and then of course we were at that time making inroads into the Lexington deal in Rupp Arena and drawing some pretty good crowds there, and and that was their home base. Uh, what I'm saying to you is the fact that that came out of that kind of climate, and I think that's the reason why the reaction to it was so real and sudden and violent, because it came out of a violent situation. I do want to I want to bring up two things, and we got a full bank of calls, so I want to get to them as well. Okay. Uh, Cut one me of the off things if I get too long, Dave. No, no, it's okay. The, <laughs> the, I remember. Early on, you know, Memphis wrestling. This is this is. I'm going to the early '80s now. Okay. Uh, became this classic video when people first started getting videotape recorders. Um, you know, the people started trading wrestling tapes because in those days, you know, the Memphis show would be in like you know five or six markets. I mean, it was in Nashville, Louisville, Lexington, probably a couple of others, Evansville. Right. You know, you had your your those people in those cities. See, nobody else ever saw it, and that was like it was. Everywhere, San Francisco wrestling you saw in San Francisco, Sacramento, Fresno, nobody else saw it. And then video tapes came in, and the real hardcore fans, and that's where I was involved, we started trading videos, and the Memphis ones and the Japanese tapes were like the big thing, you know, some of the Carolinas. There were other territories as well. Mid-South was a big deal. But I remember, um, what was that like? I mean, you had always done wrestling for this regional thing, and I mean, I know you were aware of it early on, that there were people all over the country all of a sudden watching your, your shows. I mean, not a lot of them, but they were there. You know, it, it really, and I can relate this, if I may, uh, to a situation that took place in, when I went with WCW and, and started traveling um, around doing, doing 900 number stuff, radio type stuff of, of broadcasting for the WCW 900 number. And I went into, and one example was I went into, uh, into Boston and and uh, 
we're in in the arena and maybe an hour before and uh I'm sitting up there and we're getting our equipment around and people started coming up and talking to me, you know, and I'm thinking what <laughs> are you from March, Mississippi or what well, I mean how no no no, I've seen some of the tapes and it it was just a, a absolutely mind blowing <laughs> experience to uh as you said be be the ringmaster over about five markets in the in the mid south around there and then uh having these people come up and start talking and ask as tony mentioned about a specific incident start asking about particular incidents that took place on shows and it was uh, frankly it was great <laughs> It made me uh, it made me feel more alive. I really do believe. <laughs> well, I wanted to bring up because we started talking right before the break about um, the whole situation with Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo and mm -hmm. Angelo Poffo and Angelo, you yeah. know, and uh, you know Jerry Jarrett and Angelo Poffo were in a really nasty promotional war, and when they settled it, they did some big business together with Jerry Lawler against Randy Savage. Um, you know, talk a little bit about the background because that's that's some. I mean, they were. The Poffos would go on TV, and I mean, they said stuff that you weren't supposed to say in those days about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember. I mean, they were talking about breaking kayfabe. I mean, they would, you know, they were running down guys and. Oh, they were giving the everybody's real name, which, as you know, back in those days was a really big deal. You know, yeah. you had. I mean, today, so <laughs> it still is in some respects, but not like it was then. And they were going on there, and they would talk about Tojo Yamamoto and his real name and where he was really from. And all he's not—he wasn't Japanese. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And it—it um, it was a situation where they were on. Uh, they wouldn't appreciate me saying this, but we referred to it from old radio days as a as a little tea kettle, and nobody was watching the station or their show. And um, I'm not saying this to put myself over. Uh, I'm long since <laughs> past that, I think, but uh, or maybe not. I don't know. But anyhow, I, I had to disagree and argue with with some of the folks running the show there because they had had all they wanted to have and wanted to get on there and start firing back at these guys on the air. And it obviously was would have been the most stupid thing in the world because um, of the audience that we had going at that time, they didn't even know who these people were. And that was their only source. If we started talking about them and recognizing them, that was the only way in the world that they were ever going to get any kind of attention. And, uh, and, and so cooler heads prevailed and and we did not do that but it was really nasty and I'm telling you I went and this was the strangest it, stop me Dave because this is this is a fairly long story <laughs> the, Dave Brown went with me the first time on the road he and his wife Margaret and, and my wife Audrey and, and we went up in the van to do a show at Rupp Arena up there and, and it was the first time Dave came and the minute I stepped out of the van in the parking lot behind Rupp Arena I hear this hey Russell you're going to get us kicked off of another show or station or something like you know and who is it but Randy and uh, well anyhow I'll leave out part of it but uh, <laughs> it really you know looked nasty I mean they were they were there a guy had already been arrested earlier one of their guys had been arrested for coming in an area the police told him to stay out of and all of that and they went up and had a big brouhaha in a court and and they they got fined he got fined and and so on so a lot of really bad blood Dave and I were the only two guys in the backstage Rupp arena that didn't have a piece I'm talking gun, because when we started across that uh, freeway, that uh, toll road, and how in the world would I ever forget it, going over to 65 to go down to Nashville, when we got ready to bail out of there, we had done the show, and they had bought tickets and come in, and we had to, had the security all alerted about keeping them in their seats, and I mean, really tension. Man, you can't believe the tension. 
And when we started out and went backstage and Dave and I were getting ready to, to collect our wives and head out to the van and go in, and Sonny King, you remember Big Sonny by any chance? Oh, I remember Sonny King, sure. Oh, let me tell you, pure and simple, one of the toughest guys outside the ring I have ever known in my life. He was uh, he was a hunk of man, I'm telling you that. Let me lead the way, Sonny says, going across that pay, that, that pay toll road going over to 65 from Lexington. And we went back in there, and all we heard were hammers <laughs> being checked and cylinders <laughs> being checked for bullets. I mean, guns were popping up everywhere because the word was that they were going to jump us going across that desolate road going over to 65. And um, that was the last time Dave ever went on the road with <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he didn't Honestly, need that. for getting off into that. There's a lot more to it, but it really was vicious. And the interesting thing, I will say this, once they put together uh, a deal, Angelo and Jared put together a deal in there, um, it was so intense and so real that it is my feeling that's what killed Lexington as a super town for us. Really? I think that was the actual reason, because all of the stuff about about Randy and the stuff that was, when they put it together, and the, of course, the first night, holy macro, Lawler. Oh, yeah, Jerry, Jerry Lawler, Randy Savage, the first night in Lexington, that's the record. Oh, jeez, unbelievable. I mean, yeah. it, it was it was just unbelievable. But all of that, and it was so intense and so truthful and and. And all, and I don't mean shoot interviews. What I mean is real. I mean <laughs> all the stuff that was being said, and the people then got to see as time went on, uh, the cracks came down, and they couldn't keep the intensity up, and they got to see that, uh, you know, maybe this was all a big plot that Randy had had done where they could draw people in to rub and all of that. Anyhow, I, I personally think that's what uh, what ended Rupp as being a regular once a month super town to come over. Based on that story we just were talking that Lance was just telling everyone, I want to make mention for those for those of you who collect old videos, one video I would go out and go out of my way to get would be the first appearance in the Memphis TV studio of Randy Savage because that when he his story brought that to mind. That thing, which was at that point already an angle, but built up by, you know, a year plus, or I don't know how long it was, of what was not an angle, and they were playing off of that stuff in the angle. I mean, it was, you're watching this TV, and you're thinking, you know, I remember watching this, and I knew that at that point it was already an angle, and yet you're just watching Randy Savage, and it was, it was un, that was an unbelievable performance by Randy Savage. Boy, I, I want to tell you, Dave, and I'll say this very quickly, uh, because I, I do want to get this across that I was scared to death of Randy Savage. I mean, you're talking about Scott Tyner. I, I thought Randy Savage was going to was going to break my neck. And as it turned out, Randy, when he when he left there and, and went on, he came up, man, it was a real man, and a, and said, hey, you didn't have to be nice to me. You didn't have to do a straight job with me. I appreciate it. And he was, you know, what a great guy. I just, uh, but he, man, he was scary. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was what it was like. So anyway, let's go to Bud in Pennsylvania. Bud, what's going on? Hey Dave, big fan of yours. Uh, Thank you. I was calling to talk about the, the Rob Van Dam story today. Yes. I was wondering what the deal was. Uh, as as far as well, it's, it's, I it's, it's, you said it's, earlier and you had up the story that he had uh, quit three weeks ago. Then I went to uh, Pro Wrestling Torch and One Wrestling, and they had said there was an anonymous email. That's said he quit three weeks ago, and they checked the sources and said he still hasn't quit yet. He's thinking about it. I was just wondering, do you like just run any stories with emails? Like, I mean, I had, like, I had talked, I had, like, I had talked to five different people, three of whom were very close to Rob, and they said that he had quit. And Rob had told people he had quit, and he told, told many of his friends that he had quit. Technically, he has not quit, but uh, it had nothing to do with an anonymous email. Well, I mean, that's what everyone else is reporting, and, and that he hasn't quit, and they got the information. Well, there were other people who reported that he did quit, too, but it didn't have to do with an anonymous, it did, had nothing to do with an anonymous email. Oh, well, it just seemed like you'd like, run a story like you, like... I wouldn't run a story based on an anonymous email. Okay, and like, you know, like a fabulous Muller's in a porno or something, run that email or something. I didn't write, I never ran anything like that. 
I know. It did just seemed because everyone else in the United see me. I was just checking to see where you're coming from. I'm a big fan of you. Oh, I was all all night last night. I was talking to people who were, you know, that's pretty much what I was doing yesterday afternoon and all night was talking to different people about the Van Dam thing. I mean, because did you talk uh, to Paul Heyman? Because they had other I talked to Paul. I talked. I talked to Paul Heyman. Yeah. And did he tell you that he wasn't fired? That's Paul Heyman. Like Paul you. Heyman told well, what Paul Heyman told me. I can't say because he insisted everything was off the record. Uh, if okay. it was, I would I would print a quote from him. He told me that he would not say anything on the record, but I talked to Paul Heyman, yeah. Okay. And I just had a question for Lance Russell. Yes, sir. Could you do your famous, uh, they put the flag on the cowboy quote? Put the flag on the cowboy? I don't know this one. Whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm... Are you sure? Are you, that's, that's Jim Ross. That was Jim Ross. Oh, forget it. <laughs> Let's go to Dave in Cincinnati. How are you doing? Doing really good. Dave. Yes, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I wanted to call in tomorrow, but I'm, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to. So I had a question about Missy Hyatt. I don't know, maybe Lance or you could answer. Uh huh. All right. Uh, shortly after uh, Jim Crockett Promotions uh, bought the UWF, uh, several people uh, went to Jim Crockett Promotions, including uh, uh, like Sting, Rick Steiner, Eddie Gilbert, uh, Terry Taylor. However, uh, the one man gang went to Titan Sports. And so did Missy so, Hyatt. And so, and so, and so did Ted DiBiase. Uh, yeah, but I think he was in Japan at the time, wasn't he? He Ted was in Japan when the sale went down, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, my my question was, wasn't uh, Missy I remember, didn't Missy Hyatt, I mean, you reported in the uh, Observer at that time that Missy Hyatt was going to go to the WWF, and I believe she even showed up at a TV taping. Wasn't she supposed to replace Piper's pit? What exactly? Yeah, Missy's Manor. They did a couple of them. They weren't that good, and Missy just kind of lost her job in the WWF. Is that what but happened? Yeah, Missy Hyatt was going to be brought in and be a. She was going to be a big deal, and I'm not sure exactly what went down. I just remember that people were disappointed and it just never materialized. But yes, yeah, it was a big deal when she was brought in, and she was brought in for a big push. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, I, I, this has been a very busy week, but I will send you that uh, tape of the WCW Classics episode. Mm -hmm. But when I watched those, when, they, when I watched that old footage that they show from like the early '80s, it's just amazing, like how many, how much heat that even some of the undercard matches had. Like to go back and watch, like a simple run in back then, you would have like a ton of heat, and it was like a big deal, but. Now it's just, when you watch on like WWF Raw that there's a basic run and it just doesn't even mean anything. Well, it's just it's it's, it's it's yeah. Well, it's because yeah, it's because it happens with such frequently and it's frequency, and there's so much television product. When you have one hour of, of wrestling a week on TV or two hours, um, you know it's a lot different than the number of hours that you have now. But also that uh, fans were conditioned to watch squash matches, so when yeah. thing happened, I mean even if it was a mid Carter, the fans would. Would go nuts. Yeah, I mean TV tapings. Yeah, because the TV tapings were form were very formula. I mean, you had two top guys going against each other on TV. The fans were ready for something to happen, and so they reacted to everything. So I mean, I don't even know if this is such a smart move to air this footage. I mean, because this footage is basically being aired in markets such as the Carolinas and uh, Georgia, and these are like the WCW's loyal audience. And for them to see, like, what WCW used to be 20 years ago, I mean, you've got clips of these Piper and Flair interviews. and then to see Yeah, I know, and compare it to the stuff now. Bad. I know. That was one of the reasons WWF why I think... definitely get away with it because the mid-'80s period, it was a much slower WWF. But well, they kind of did that with the much... Nitro, too, right before Russo and Bischoff came back. And they had all these they had all this Nitro footage from three or four years ago that was just Oh, it was so hot. Yeah, and then it's like these guys are going to come back, and if they didn't recreate that, everyone's going to think they failed, and of course it was impossible to. Whenever I see footage of that old set of Nitro, is it just me or is that old set actually better than the new set? Uh, it was better. <laughs> yeah, when I, whenever I see footage of something from the old set, I always think of the glory days of WCW. Dave, we got to get running because we got a, a lot of calls to get to. Okay. Okay. All right, let's go to Dennis in Missouri. Dennis. Hey, Dave. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you, Mr. Russell. As a totally blind person who's been a wrestling fan for 25 years, I've always appreciated your uh, ability to describe what's going on in the ring. Well, thank you, Dennis. That's, that's my uh, very my kind question of... is, how much did do you think that the that the car accident that Eddie, or Eddie Gilbert was involved in affected his career? Because it seemed like at the time, right before he had it, he was 
really starting to uh, take off and, and go places. And after that, I'm, it didn't really seem like to me he ever got another chance. Well, um, I think that it uh, affected it a, a lot, and I'm not really certain from the standpoint that you're talking about. I think the the pain that Eddie had out of it um, was one of the problems that uh, that resulted from it that stayed with him. And um, I, there's no question you are right that that was kind of a point of demarcation for Eddie right there. When he when he was going back and had that had that uh, automobile accident, um, I guess what I was getting at is that Eddie Gilbert always to me seemed like a, a person who uh, had tremendous charisma. He could either be a heel or uh, a face and be the top one, either one. But he never seemed to get another chance to prove himself after the car accident. Now he, I, I think Eddie's best years as far as a push were actually after because the car accident was eighty three and he was. He was like a young guy in the business. I mean, by 83, he was only 22 years old. That's right. So he had chances, but I think that, you know, he, you know, the, the pride thing I last said is the problem stemming from the pain he was in in the car accident probably hurt him from getting as far as he probably would have gotten. Had there, I mean, if had there not been a car accident, it, it probably would have changed. But he, his, I thought his best success, I don't think there's any question his best success came after because his best success would have been, what would you say on it? I mean, yeah, a little bit WCW, and that's late 80s, although the real, I mean, Continental when he was booking it himself, and then maybe uh, the early, you know, right before ECW in that, that period, uh, where he was kind of a big cult favorite, or the, what was it, the, what was the name of that promotion before ECW, the TWA, where Eddie Gilbert and Cactus Jack had those memorable matches? Mm -hmm. So, you know, but Eddie, you know, he, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, he, he was in a lot of pain, and, and that, you know, you could talk to Missy Hyatt about that, about Eddie, you know, because she was there. She knows better than probably anyone. She'll about be the on whole... tomorrow, right, Dave? And she'll be on tomorrow, yeah. The other question I have is um, I've always, I, and I've tried to describe him to people, and I don't think I've ever done him justice. Um, to me, Joe Ledoux was one of the greatest heels that I can oh, ever yeah. remember. Mm -hmm. In Memphis. That, Lance, tell him about the Blood Oath. <laughs> Boy, that was, uh, he comes out there, and this is live television with that small studio audience. And the intimacy that we talked about, and Joe comes out, and a lot of you may have seen the tape, and he uh, holds his, he's going against Lawler, and he's talking about how you know I'm going to take a blood oath that uh, I'm going to kill you, Lawler, and he takes this double-edged axe, and this is just a straight up happened exactly the way it came off. I almost died when I saw it. He takes this axe, drags it across his forearm and slits his arm wide open. The blood starts pouring down, and we say, uh, take a break, take a break. It was, whoa, I mean, it was something. And LeDuc did it because he just he just got into that thing. That's the way he was. Didn't he also do something to Lawler's leg with an axe? I know it was to set up a time when Lawler was actually hurt, but I seem to recall him doing something to Lawler's leg with an axe. Well, if he did, I don't relate it to the axe. Um, the I, I, I think the arm thing that he did to himself is so dominant as far as a memory goes that that I that I may not remember it. No, I I don't remember anything in relationship to the axe. I'm certain that it was used, but I don't remember anything that sticks in my mind about my it. My final question is why didn't uh, and I know he wrestled a lot in in. Uh, Memphis, Buddy Landell seemed to be another person who whew, never really seemed to get the chance he deserved. Well, you know, Dennis, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking the guy. What I'm going to tell you is that I think a lot of times that was the result of maybe some uh, inappropriate action possibly on whoever's part you might be talking about. Landell, I thought, had as much pure talent he could do it all. He could wrestle. He he was not a great, great wrestler. He was a good wrestler. He was a great mouth. And uh, don't you think, Davey, that he probably, uh, in his particular case, that, that he, he may have his, gotten himself in... Buddy Landell was his own worst enemy, and he'll be the first one to tell you. Absolutely. Because, because he's told me on many occasions that same thing. The thing with Buddy Landell, if you go about the mid-1980s, 
whether it was in the Crockett promotion. I mean, he was on the verge of a big, big push, and because because of cocaine, he couldn't get out of bed one day. Um, when he was national heavyweight champion and about to shoot some big angle, I think with Flair or Dusty, which would have propelled him to that top level, he just didn't get out of bed, mm. and and he got fired. And in Memphis, I mean, I'll tell you what, memory you know, memory I have is um, it was Jerry Lawler and I think Dutch Mantel against Bill Dundee and Buddy Landell week after week, and probably around eighty five, eighty six. I'm not sure of the year where they were in Memphis, and I mean these were unbelievable matches. And Buddy Landell at that point was the best of the four. He, he he just had tremendous gifts in the ring, but you know again he 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 self destructed. Yes, he did. It's exactly what happened. I guess that's kind of a result of the changing times. If somebody had a drug problem like that, um, in these days you wouldn't know about it. I mean, I remember hearing stories about Gino Hernandez, but that was long after he passed away. You didn't hear about well, Gene, it. Gino 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 really came out because he died from from a cocaine overdose. Yeah. Right. Yeah, with Buddy, but Buddy, Buddy's been very upfront about it. I mean, if you talk to him now, I mean, he'll he'll admit to everything that he did in in that period, and and he'll admit to being a guy who, you know, hey, Buddy Landell should have been one of the biggest stars in the business, and absolutely, and absolutely. it didn't happen, and you know, he only blame he only blames himself, and unfortunately, a couple of times when he was had a chance to make a com comebacks, he ended up getting injured because it was a little later, and he had he had a lot of. He had a lot of bad luck, and he gave himself a lot of bad luck. And it was too bad because I tell you what, when it came to talking and everything, he was—he was a he had this tremendous knack for being able to get people to hate him. Okay, Dave, I know you had other phone calls. I'm really looking forward to Missy tomorrow. Oh, good, good. Okay, well, let's go to uh, Joe in West Virginia. Joe, you're next up. Hey, it's an honor. Good uh, to everybody. Hi. Hey, Mr. Russell, if I, yes, I, I have one question. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Joe. If you had one, uh, if you had to. Uh, one match you could have called a dream match, who would it have been and where would it have been? Like, who would have been in it and where would the match have been held? Well, what almost took place, I would have really loved to have seen because I uh, I probably am a lot higher, uh, and, and that sounds uh, demeaning to say it that way, but what I was going to say is I'm a lot higher on Jerry Lawler than, than, than a lot of people in the wrestling fan. I saw Lawler do stuff. I saw Lawler carry matches that were absolutely incredible. His mouth is, well, that's what he's doing now. They had originally set it up to have Ric Flair and Jerry Lawler meet oh, yeah. in, an, in an, a, a stadium match in Memphis. And there's a whole long story behind that, and we certainly don't have time to get into it, And but a, it it never took place, and I really am sorry about it because you asked me a question, and that was a match that I was really looking forward to being able to call was Jerry Lawler and Ric Flair. It, it could have been one of those kind that you just that don't come along. Two the best characters ever. Too many centuries, huh? Two of the best characters ever in wrestling. Yeah, I don't remember the one the one time, or maybe one time Ric Flair. I just probably was a prelude to that match not taking place. Ric Flair came into the Memphis studio. What and what a performance he put on! Yeah, and then they were, they built up. They did a thing where Lawler beat him on a count, and it was obviously to build up a match. And you know whatever happened with the promotions, you know better than I. I just know that the match never took place. That's right. Yeah, that's just good. Yeah. well, as I said, that's a long story, and we don't have near the time, Dave, to get Any, into that. Anything else, Joe? No, I just want to thank you. It's a great show. Keep it up. Oh, thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, okay. Um, what was I going to say about uh, about that? The there was another thing you were talking about with Lawler is that Lawler you talk about being able to carry people. I remember seeing clips. I don't. I didn't see the whole match. But it was Lawler and Leon Spinks, and believe me, nobody ever got a good match out of Leon Spinks. And Lawler, Lawler. I mean, I remember before that match, and and Lawler was already up, kind of up in years, but still yeah. a good worker. And I remember like uh, you know, you know, Lawler could talk people into buying tickets for Leon Spinks. And, you know, Leon Spinks was a world heavyweight boxing champion. He had yeah. credentials. And, but I thought when they got in the ring, this was going to be, you know, even Jerry Lawler couldn't make a match. And somehow, I mean, it wouldn't be, nobody would even call it a good match by today's standards. But believe me, it was a, it was a great match because for Leon Spinks because I saw the stuff he did in Japan. It was unbelievably bad. <laughs> he could do that. I'll tell you. Uh, it used to be almost an irritating thing with Jerry. This is in the, in the latter days of me after I left WCW and came back to Memphis and all. Jerry would um, take these kids, these green kids that were trying to make into attractions and all, 
and uh, like almost do jobs, you know. I mean, it just was, and he was so great at it, but it it had to wear away a little bit on his uh, uh, on his uh, what people thought of him and how good he really was because he, he just he just could do such a number with these young kids. It was great. It was just a masterpiece to watch him work. We are like totally out of time, Lance. This was just a total pleasure, yeah. and uh, we got to do this again. And um, we, and talk about the next time we were on. We'll talk about that Lawler Ric Flair story. We'll get to the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, Dave. Thank you for helping an old man relive some great moments. You got some great fans, and I enjoy enjoy your stuff. You know that. And uh, thank you again for having me on. Yeah.